welcome to Up Close and Personal. And another edition of the uh, interview series Up Close and Personal. This one, a very special guest in studio with me, none other than Johnny Chester, now known as John Chester. Thanks, Alex. Actually, when I say now known, or when you say now known, I guess I've always been John Chester. But all the posters, all the album covers have got Johnny on them, <laughs> and I can't afford to change. Yes. So it's sort of you've been, if I may use the term, been labelled with that. Yes. Johnny, where did it all begin? You're born in Melbourne. Oh, yeah, born in Fitzroy, North Fitzroy. North Fitzroy, yeah. and uh, 1941. Yep, mm. mum was, uh, mum was uh, or rather dad was born in Fitzroy, my grandfather was born in Fitzroy. So, so you've got a big connection there. Yeah, and so you'll be surprised to know who I follow in the football. And uh, <laughs> But then that was, that was sort of not my doing. They wouldn't let me out of the hospital until I signed a piece of paper. So, you know. Is that a fact? There you go. How how did it all come about? I mean, we, we remember uh, Johnny Chester and the Chessmen, I think it was, wasn't it? It certainly was. How did that all begin? Well, it was it, really by accident. Mm. Uh, when I say that, I, I once again, the movies, I've, I've always been a bit of a, not a movie buff really, but I enjoyed, them, you know, enjoyed going to the pictures mm. when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I'd uh, been staying down at Rosebud uh, on the foreshore with a uh, mate and his family, and uh, I went along to the local Rosebud Picture Theatre, uh, one, I don't know when it was, uh, anyway, went along, and there was a movie that John Saxon was in, oh, and yes. uh, it was, you know, it was a, one of those forgettable movies. And I B grade. Even, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I went along and, and saw this, and uh, he was a guitar player in a combo, didn't call it a band, a combo, it was like a five piece band. Mm. And he played this really flash-looking, probably a Gibson guitar, and uh, he had girls hanging off him like you wouldn't believe. And when you're 16, 17, that's pretty impressive. You know, I don't, still don't know if he could play the guitar. I <laughs> had no idea. I knew he was holding it in the right direction. So I, uh, I was very impressed with that fact. And mm. so I, I went home and I said, I'm, I'm going to buy a guitar. And that was the whole reason. It was all to do with you know, having girls hanging off you, quite frankly. And so um, I bought the guitar and I started to drive a couple of uh, music teachers nuts, uh, trying to teach me. You know, it took them three months to teach me how to get out of the case, you know, things like that. Just little things that suggested that maybe music wasn't where I was headed. Yeah. But uh, I got that uh, done. And then went on to the banjo club, like all good budding guitarists did in those okay, days. Yes. And we'd have 75 people in the room and they'd tune up the first three. And uh, the rest of you were on your own, just work your way through when it's springtime in the Rockies. And, uh, which they, was fun when the 70 people out of tune. They broadcast on radio, didn't they, the banjo club? I oh, think. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it was a huge thing. And on television, they yeah. used to be on Swallows Juniors. That's Remember, they right. all with their banjo that's with all the, that's three it. million ribbons hanging off them. You <laughs> that's know. <right>. All, <laughs> and it, but once again, there's a lot of good people came out of there. Oh, I wasn't right. one of them. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so you've got the guitar, you've got it out of the case and you're strumming along. How did the group of the band come about? Well, I, I had a mate who was learning drums mm -hmm. in a similar fashion. He didn't have a drum kit, but, you know. Anything he could a bash. Small, a small, small, <laughs> <laughs> just, just a little glitch. Uh, and another mate was learning double bass. And right. we sort of had in our minds that we were going to start a band mm -hmm. sometime down the, anyway. So this was 1959, early 59. I used to go on the tram because I, you know, I was only seventeen. So I, I'd go, I'd, I'd work in Swanson Street and walk down with my guitar to the banjo club uh, from Dad's garage where I worked, and then go home on the tram. And I'd get off and uh, at the local milk bar and have a malted or whatever, you know. And mm -hmm. word got around that uh, you know about this, this kid with the guitar and. And it spread a bit further, like right up as far as Regent, which, you know, from Preston's probably 200 yards. But anyway, <laughs> uh, so uh, oh, I had um, the word got around and, and our drummer was called up into the army to do his Nasho. Oh, right. And so that sort of, you know, mucked things up a bit. And uh, 
By this stage, I'd graduated to going up to the local espresso bar, which was even closer to the Regent. And, and uh, uh, I was sitting there one night and a, this kid walks in and he saw me. He said, oh, I, I believe you're starting a band. And I kind of big noting a bit, said, oh, well, yeah, we were, but the drummer's been called up. And so, you know, no, I don't probably... You know, you've got to bear in mind that I couldn't play the guitar at all. I, you know... And he said, oh, well, I play drums. And I went, oh. <laughs> uh, he said, and I know a bloke who plays piano. Another one plays saxophone. And I'm going, oh. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, and he said, and I know a bloke plays guitar. And I went, oh, thank goodness for that. So the band sort of formed and I was not able to do anything. So... So we went along, we had a practice at his place on the Saturday morning, or uh-huh. uh, the Saturday afternoon, the following Saturday afternoon, and uh, we had a piano player, but he didn't have a piano, this chap that was at the drummer. So uh, we had a practice, and so we had a piano player who couldn't play piano and a guitarist who couldn't play guitar, not a bad start out of six pieces. Yeah. And uh, uh, I said, look... Um, Maybe we, if we went to where I go to youth club, they've got a piano at the hall. We can get the hall for probably about two bob each for the Saturday afternoon. And they said, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. So the next Saturday we, we practised at the hall, the St Cecilia's uh, Parish Hall in West Preston. And being at the time, it was kind of October. It was in mid midway between the footy season and the cricket season and too, too cool for mm-hmm. swimming. Mm-hmm. So uh, lots of kids wandering around the street and that, and friends of ours as well. So they heard the music, so they came in to watch and it was just rock and roll and so they started to dance. And then the next week we had another practice, even more kids turned up. And... Uh, I opened my app and said, uh, you know, I reckon if we ran this of a Saturday night, yes. we could probably make it work. And they all turned around the band and said, well, why don't you? So I not only accidentally was in, by this stage I might add, I was singing a few songs because I couldn't play the guitar. Uh, I became a dance promoter. Uh, once again, knew nothing about that either. Mm-hmm. Uh, but mum offered to you know, sell the tickets and Dad offered to stand on the door and another mate of mine offered to sell the drinks. Uh, he made more money than anybody. <laughs> uh, and uh, and so it began in in uh, September 1959. In in the, the West Preston uh, St Cecilia's Saint Parish Hall. St Cecilia's, the, the patron saint of music, I found well, out years well, later. There you are. I, See, don't know, I don't know if St Cecilia's still <laughs> admits to that after us doing what we did, but... <laughs> Well, it was destined, obviously, uh, because you were in safe hands, obviously, over there. <coughs> John, you, you made a transition uh, from rock into the country area. What what was behind that? Is there anything that happened in your life that made that transition? Uh, probably. Uh, I, I've always... My mum and dad had a reasonable record collection. Mm-hmm. Uh, amongst them with people like Slim Whitman... Uh, and, and Slim Whitman, and of course Slim, Slim Whitman. Whitman. I, that's just a name, one or three names that I remember. Yeah. But um, and of course, then Smokey Dawson was on the radio on Three KZ, and he mm-hmm. would get on and sing his his uh, you know his cowboy songs, you know. And I thought that was lovely. And he'd do rope tricks, which is great on radio. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so <laughs> so we would. Um, uh, but that had an influence on me. I loved Roy Rogers and, and oh. Gene Autry oh. and that sort of stuff. So it was as much the Western <clears throat> side of it oh. as much as it was the country side of it. And then, so that was as a kid. And then as I got into music, I was invited to work with Slim Dusty. Uh, this was 1963. Wow. By this stage, I'd been, I'd been do, doing mostly dances, uh, some festival hall shows with yeah. you know, Roy Orbison, et etc. et cetera. Yes. But it was all rock and roll. Mm. And then I was invited to do his his show up in Brisbane at their exhibition, their equivalent of our East uh, our uh, Royal Melbourne show. Yeah. So it was in the tent. I think we were doing twenty shows a day. We should do one song. Yeah. And then get up on the thing, and the bloke had snapped the whip and beat the drum and you know megaphone and you know come on roll up roll up and yeah. you'd go up there and nod your head and wave to the people, go back and sing the same song, and we did that for eight. Eight days, 
<laughs> and what came out of it for me was that I noticed for the first time in my life I had an audience who actually listened. Mm. They weren't they weren't you know screaming and throwing pennies if they didn't like it. They were actually <laughs> listening, and uh, that must have had a bigger impression on me than I thought. So I went on the way home. I had to do bandstand uh, television show, mm -hmm. and out uh, of Sydney. Yeah, mm. and so I stopped there. While I was there, I was staying in a little pub in uh, Double Bay, and this idea came to me about uh, called the old copper kettle, and it was a song uh, that I it, it was real country, you know, mm -hmm. very country. So when mm -hmm. I got back, I recorded it mm -hmm. and put it on the flip side of a, a, a rocker. Mm -hmm. And it got quite a lot of airplay, uh, particularly in the state. John Laws, I think, for the first time played one of my records when he played the Copper Kettle. Yeah, uh, just drop, never... a, drop a name. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, when I say he played it, I don't know how often, but he never played any of the others at all from what I gather. Oh, that's good. So it sort of, it kind of, that's where it started. And then when I was on UZ late, years later and had a chance to think about what I wanted to do next, mm. uh, country music just kept bobbing up. And uh, when I'd write a song, I'd probably, I think in the whole time I was singing rock and roll, I think I won, uh, wrote one rock and roll song, but yeah. so many of the others were kind of country. Country flavour. Listen, I think we should have some music. Uh, and you've chosen one from a CD entitled Memories That Linger. And uh, I love you so, Rebecca. Mm -hmm. Let's have a listen. <laughs> said to me one day son an angel will come your way not from up above but she'll show you how to love in a way that you will think is heavenly and though it may seem absurd every one of my Mama's words came through the day my darling came to me. Oh, Rebecca, you taught me how to live. You had some love and you had to give. And I'm so glad you gave it all to me. Cause I love you so. I can hardly hear the words the preacher's saying Then I hear you say I do As I'd pledge my love to you Oh, I know you are the answer to all my praying In your gown of satin lace As the veil falls from your face Shows how our lives will be Oh, Rebecca, you taught me how to live You had some love and you had to give And I'm so glad you gave it all to me Cause I love you so
Rather like that song, John. One of your own compositions, I understand, written about 1979. Yes, it goes back a while. I started, think, I think I started writing it about 75 or something like that. And uh, uh, for an album I was doing for Ron Tudor with Fable. Oh, there's Fable, a name, no Fable Fable Label. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, it, I, it just wasn't complete. And I, we actually did a version of it, mm. uh, but it just it didn't have the chorus, the I Love You So Rebecca part. Right. And so it, it sat there, complete up to, except for that. Yeah. And I was sound asleep one morning and... Uh, about three o'clock and I just woke up with that chorus going through my head. Don't ask me why. Got up, went down to the little cassette in my office and mm -hmm. sang it to myself and uh, and then we recorded it. But that was about five years later. I've heard that story before where people sit bolt upright in bed, something comes to them in a flash like that and, and, and there it is, it's a hit, you know. Mm -hmm. But that's great. Uh, CD is entitled Memories That Linger and is still available, I'm sure it yes, is. Yes, it is, actually. It's only been out a short time. Right. It? Well, then, if uh, any good record stores, no doubt, will have that, I'm sure that Katie's will have it out there. Oh, I would think so. In <laughs> fact, I have it on, on very good authority that they, they do. Now, you toured a lot uh, back in the day with uh, groups like the Beatles, Roy Orbison, when they were out here on uh, Everly Brothers, Kenny Rogers. Good experience? Uh, they were all good experiences. I mean, good, bad, it's still good experience, if yeah. you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, I can't think of anything that really uh, upset me at all mm. about it, mm. but some things were better than others. The Beatles tour, of course, was uh, probably about the like, fourth uh, overseas act that I'd worked with. Right. And it was so much different. Like Roy Orbison, the first time he came out, uh, we did the tour, which was basically Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne. And uh, it was poorly promoted. And we were playing, like the Sydney Stadium, give you some idea, I think seats 11,000 people. And yeah. I think there were 300 people. Oh, there. my stars. And and it's like a circular stage, and, or it's a boxing ring that actually rotates. Yeah. So... You'd have 300 people in an 11,000 seat of auditorium and they'd be one up there and <laughs> one up there and two down here and one there and you'd get around and there'd be four people in a row and you'd be, wow, working, really working to them, you know, but only briefly because they the, kept the turning thing, around. Turn around. Yeah. Exactly. It wasn't easy, but uh, Roy slaughtered them. Mm. He was just amazing and uh, that wonderful voice. Um, at Sydney Stadium, to 300 people, he did the last four bars of crying six times. You know, they'd all scream for it mm. when he finished. Mm. So he'd just do, the, do it again. You know, was that Ronnie? No, Ronnie Sears. He'd turn around and, and she walked away and walked away with me. You know, I yeah. can't do it yeah. and, uh, without hurting myself. <laughs> but um, he, um, uh, he was amazing, but poorly promoted the whole thing. Tragedy. And then the Everly Brothers wasn't any better. But then the Beatles, of course, you know, they oh. talk about, you know, in my case, being uh, uh, very fortunate to be asked to do it at the time because they were massive. And, of course, every, there was nothing that wasn't provided. We were, you know, it was catered for in between two shows a night. We're doing, I don't know, three or four, I forget how many nights we did in Melbourne. Mm. And uh, in between shows... We all sat down and had, you know, a three-course meal together and it was all, everything was lovely and even though we weren't, you know, the the, the rest of the mob weren't driven around in limousines and all that sort of stuff, mm. not that I'd expect it, mm. but we all stayed in the same pubs in most cases, Great. Uh, Great. Uh, flew in the same aircraft, etc., 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 and that was quite amazing. And then, of course, later on with Kenny Rogers and that, that was a very good one, Johnny Cash, Tammy with it, but of course the whole business had changed greatly by then. Yeah, you had some time on radio on three years it. Yeah, ten I, years or so. Yes, I I was on staff for ten years. I I, I was on air for two and a half of those. You were doing midnight, midnight to dawn, was it? Midnight to dawn, yeah, yeah. and then went went to uh, one a.m. to five thirty. Right. Uh, uh, and Stan, the man, was on from 10, he would 10 to 12, and then he went 10 to, th to 1. Oh, roof. That was him. <laughs> and, uh, and I used to follow Stan and uh, uh, on you know, three nights a week anyway. Yeah. And um, it was probably professionally the, the greatest experience that I've ever had because mm. they were the, by far the number one station, probably yeah. in Australia. Yeah. They had the best disc jockey team, yeah. and it was 
it, it went right through the organisation. Like everybody in the place, it was like a really was like a big family, mm. and uh, everybody from Charlie the cleaner right through to uh, you know, Nora and Dorian on the switchboard yeah. to Lewis Bennett to John McMahon. You know, they were just wonderful people to work with, and yeah. uh, I learnt so much that I still put in good use today. It yeah. helped me so much with putting a show together. Good you know, grounding. I do a live show. Very good grounding. Just, yeah, just mm. amazing. And, mm. of course, I was lucky, too, to work in not only just on air but also in programming, mm. uh, to work in the promotions department, doing production, writing jingles and, and producing things for the station. Right. Uh, going out, I had to get a licence to drive a double-decker bus, which... I mean, how many people can say that? <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, so they were all just amazing things and uh, uh, really was a wonderful time. Yeah. Uh, you've got a, a new a newer CD out by the look of the <coughs> catalogue number, John. Um, what you hear is what you get. Yes, I, I um, came about a couple of reasons. I, I had a very kind review at some stage, somebody said of me on stage that you know, what you see is what you get, that, mm -hmm. you know, which I guess when I mentioned John McMahon before, he used to drum into me, be yourself. Like, I mean, if you knew John, well, you probably didn't know John, but John would get you by the scruff of the neck and he'd shake you, and he wasn't all that big, mm. but he was a marvellous man. Mm. And he'd say, be yourself, because when I started, of course, I'd be trying to be Stan Rowe for one night and I'd be trying to be Don Rains for the next night and I'd be <laughs> trying to be John Vertigan or, or Ken Sparks or Don Lan, you know, doing all this stuff. And he said, be yourself. Yeah. And I guess I've tried to that to happen with yeah. my life. Yeah. And so I thought when I was putting this together, because it's all my own songs, <clears throat> a couple that I co-wrote, one with Brian Cadd and one with a little Scottish mate of mine, Ian Grant, uh... It's very much me singing, not necessarily about personal experience, although quite a bit of it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I thought, what you hear is what you get. And there was a secondary reason. I wear hearing aids made by Siemens, the right. company. And uh, all those years of getting deafened by loud drummers and guitar players, and I blame them, they're not here. Uh, and uh, working with poor PAs and things. So I, you know, my hearing's pretty ordinary. Mm. So uh, I thought, well, maybe I can get them interested in a bit of sponsorship. This comes from my radio days too. You know, why do it yourself exactly. if you can get somebody to help you? That's true. And, and so uh, I wasn't able to do that, but I thought what you hear, what you get is probably a, a play on that original phrase and, and uh, so that's what I called it. Well, I think we're going to have a track from this. Uh, Vegemite Kisses is one that intrigues me. <laughs> Let's have a listen to Vegemite Kisses and see what you do with this. She wakes me in the morning by pulling on my nose And when my feet stick out of bed she'll tickle on my toes There's nothing I can say or do to make her change her mood When she's awake all she wants is food so I stumble from the bedroom while pulling on a robe I tell you that's not easy when both your eyes are closed I finally make the kitchen to get breakfast on its way And that's when she can really make my day When she gives me Vegemite kisses and peanut butter hugs her female intuition tells her I can't hold a grudge At two years old she gets away with everything she does By giving Vegemite kisses and peanut butter hugs Whenever she is eating she has to have some space You don't need to see the menu It's written on her face Her sticky little fingers She runs through her hair 
But I can tell you I don't really care When she gives me Vegemite kisses And peanut butter hugs Her female intuition Tells her I can't hold a grudge At two years old she gets away With everything she does By giving Vegemite kisses And peanut butter hugs she gives me Vegemite kisses and peanut butter hugs. <laughs> Very good indeed, Vegemite kisses, and that's the little granddaughter there you were telling me when uh, the song was playing about that. There's a clip of that on your website. There is, yeah. It's Johnny th- Chester dot. Com. Oh, yeah, no AU. We've got the cheaper version. And, yeah. uh, <laughs> we, we, we've gone for the cheaper version e- too. Easy, easier but to remember. Very easy to remember, and that's one of the, the good things about it. John, it's been an absolute delight having you on our program today and uh, talking about the old days and the uh, what's happening currently with you. Uh, well, yeah, it's, and thank you, first of all. Uh, I understand that uh, uh, you've only got a certain amount of time, and I my radio days taught me how to take advantage of all of that. <laughs> Uh, so I do appreciate it very, very much. I thank you for playing songs from from my CDs. Um, and they are available at all good stores. They are. Whip into JB or to Katie's over in Mount Waverley or wherever, and you can uh, pick up a nice Johnny Chester CD. Some very good stuff on and I can recommend it. Thank you, mate. All right, John, thank you so much indeed, and uh, bye for now. Bye.